The NFL playoffs are here, so bet with my bookie. Use promo code Gators and get a 50% match with your first deposit. Only at my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I am your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Joining me the day after the final college football game of 2020, day after the national championship game, here is Will Miles. You can find him at his site, readandreaction.com, and on Twitter at Will Miles SEC. And Will, with that Alabama win, one more national t- title for those guys, but it is the end of a, of a crazy, crazy 2020 football season. Yeah, we made it. I was just thinking last night about articles I was writing back in August about why we should play and how the Big Ten was a bunch of cowards and all sorts of different stuff. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, Big Ten didn't even really start playing until almost November. And, you know, the SEC had to build an extra weeks into its schedule. And you had the games that they, you know, the LSU game getting delayed to the end of the year for Florida and Alabama having something delayed as well. And, um, you know, just craziness, right? The whole the whole season long in terms of COVID, and you had the pack the swamp comments from Mullen, and then the COVID coming like a day later, and and all that sort of stuff. So it's funny when you look back at the course of events; it doesn't feel like the beginning of the season was that long ago. But we've had an awful lot happen over the course of the year, and and of course, you know, when it comes to um, college football excellence. Nick Saban is the is the beacon everybody's pointing at and everybody's shooting at. And Florida had a shot at him this year, wasn't able to get the job done. But uh, um, you know, I, I, I tweeted this after the game last night. I mean, you really have to admire what Saban has built. It's just a mm-hmm. machine, and the fact that he could lose to a tag of Valera, that he could lose um, Judy, that he could lose Rugs, and then they just they don't miss a beat. The offense is better than it was after losing those three guys. And I know it's different that the sec defenses were down this year, but they just took Ohio state. Who's pretty good defense in its own right behind the woodshed and just completely demolished them. Um, It did make me feel a little bit better for Florida's defense, to be honest with you though, Um, though, you know, moral victories are in short supply (laughs) at this point. Um, but, you know, hey, I mean, I think this is the way that 2020 needed to end is with a little bit of familiarity with Saban pulling out the win and a perfect season. And really, to be honest, Florida's six-point loss to Alabama wasn't really that close. Alabama was in control of that game, especially at halftime, and Florida made them sweat a little bit in the second half. But it really wasn't a six-point win. I mean, they, they um, you know, the, Florida was – That game was further apart than that, I think, when you look at the overall stats. And so Alabama didn't really get threatened the whole year. And, you know, congratulations to the Tide. And hopefully somebody's going to be able to come up and pick them off and say it'll start to tail off. Though, if you look at his recruiting class coming in here in 2021, um, I'm pretty sure you could have me coach that team and still they'd be pretty good. (laughs) Some labeling that class the best class ever at Alabama, too. So that's the the scary proposition for that. Well, but let's (laughs) let's remember, that's actually the 20, I want to say it was either 2009 or 2010 for Florida that got that exact same moniker. Mm -hmm. Was the best recruiting class ever. And, you know, I think that was the one that had Ronald Powell in it. Powell, Floyd, easily. Yeah, so you know yeah. these things these things change quickly and you don't necessarily see them coming. Alabama's dynasty here has been a little bit more extended than really most college football dynasties. I know there's a lot of consternation about Clemson and Ohio State and Alabama always making the playoff, but college football's been like this forever. I mean, there have always been blue bloods. I mean, there was a time when Nebraska was a dominant force in college football and always in the 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 mix for the national championship. Same thing with Florida State. You had the Florida State-Florida rivalry in the 90s when Spurrier was there. You have Miami that's risen up over time. And Alabama's had a couple of runs as well. And and so, um, you know, beyond the fact that sort of traditional entities like Nebraska and Penn State to a lesser extent and some other programs have sort of fallen off, the reality is the big boys have always ruled college football. And Alabama just happens to have the confluence of all the history and then probably the best college coach ever. Um in there. And, you know, we'll see. I I think these things change quick, right? I mean, Saban had a weird smile on his face last night that kind of made it seem like he was content. And, you know, usually they win the national championship and he's still sort of over there scowling. But last night he was smiling in a way I haven't seen in a really long time. And you do, you do wonder whether this season took a toll on him and whether maybe it's going to make him 
um, you know, think about who he's handing the reins over to. You know, obviously, he may be handing it over to somebody who's really good as well, and Florida will have to deal with him. But, um, you know, we can hope, right? I mean, at some point, uh, that's that's the good part about 2020 being over is that 2021 brings hope for next year. And, uh, you know, that, that Florida is going to be able to improve and that maybe with all the guys who are going to depart for the NFL, it won't be quite like the LSU drop-off, but – you know, there's going to be a lot of guys for Alabama who go to the NFL. And so, yeah, they got a lot of young guys and a lot of talented guys, but are those guys going to be able to step up in the same capacity? In the past, Saban has not been able to have that kind of success. That, you know, when he's won a national championship and a bunch of guys have gone to the pros, his teams have lost a couple of games and Auburn or LSU has been able to sneak into the SEC championship game. We'll see where that happens next year and maybe Florida can take advantage of it. Yeah, we'll get into it more too. But uh, going to your point, Saban, this was a, a, a tweet by Al Butler. Uh, 11 hours ago, the do, uh, saving on coaching. The to-do list started after the game last night, meeting with players, draft status, seniors can come, or seniors can even come back. Those things are immediate, and we started it last night. <laughs> I, I, thought you, I thought you went on vacation after the season. <laughs> uh, so what happened locally. So um, it's an ongoing process. I don't think you can fall asleep at the switch for a minute. So. That's the approach of one Nick Saban. So uh, there's the machine there, and then one reason why it keeps rolling and, and no signs of slowing down there. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that just a bit more before we go. Will and I will take a look back at our kind of season predictions, our over and unders. Uh, a lot of people I know are looking forward to, to, to those. Um, and uh, we'll get back. We were trying to hit it last week, but a lot to talk about. So we, we shifted it so as we shifted it to this week as we kind of take a look back. One last look at 2020 uh, and we'll look ahead to 2021 with all the way too early preseason uh, polls coming out, uh, usually the day after the national championship game. So uh, kind of the tradition that we'll look at those early tradition or early uh, way too early polls that, that come out. But first, uh, Will, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of you watching live on YouTube right now. We just passed one million YouTube views, uh, so a big thank you out there for uh, uh, the the YouTube community for that. Uh, huge uh, thanks to all of you out there for uh, for you know to all of you uh, out there for eight hundred and thirty two and. Uh, 832,400 listens for the year of 2020. So in a tough year, of course, very thankful that many of you found solace and. And, and I hope we provided some kind of distraction in a tough year. Uh, the countdown, Will, the countdown to 3 million total listens is on. Hey, man, I, I, I tweeted about this the other day when you when you put something out about it. It's just humbling, right, to, oh, to yeah. think that people trust us and listen to us and and value what we have to say and, and that, uh, you know, this is a – the, the Gator fan base is passionate, but it's also a pretty close-knit community. And so I've made some really good friends over the last three years here on the podcast, you included, but, um, you know, just people who've reached out and participated and and interfaced with all of our stuff. And we try to be as responsive as we can, though, obviously, if uh, – if news comes down on Grantham or I write something about Grantham, sometimes I don't, I'm not able to respond to every single, to every single person who, uh, who tweets at me or gets in my mentions, but we try to do the best we can to interface. Cause really that's what we, we sort of started out as, as saying, you know, Hey, we just want to be the fans, uh, you know, an interface for the fans of the program. And, and that's kind of, I feel like what, what you've built here with Gators breakdown. And, and it's, it's just really cool to see the numbers, see where they're going and, and see that people appreciate the the hard work you put into things and, uh, and the value that we bring. Yeah. Thank you much. Thank you much. And uh, also uh, live on YouTube. If you're, if you're watching there, uh, the live version, you'll notice the, the new super chat feature. You'll see the little dollar sign uh, there or, uh, on the right side of the chat for YouTube uh, here on Gators Breakdown. So, you know, for a donation, it'll highlight your comment uh, for everyone in the chat uh, to see. And if you do so, I'll post it on the stream as well. So as long as as long as the message is, is supportive or pertinent to the topic, you know, no cursing or anything like that. Uh, but we'll put it up here uh, there if you, if you guys uh, submit one that way. I get asked all the time, how can viewers or listeners support? Port Gators breakdown. So here's one way uh, right there with the, the super chat feature here on, on live on YouTube. So great way to communicate with you guys. One more way that we can communicate with you guys there. So we'll get into the meat of the episode. But before we do, remember, you can find Gators breakdown at news slash Gators breakdown. You'll find all the episodes there as well as news for Jack's coverage of the Gators. Please share, rate and review the show. YouTube guys right now, if you're live, uh, watching us live, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. really helps us out here on Gators Breakdown. Or if you just want the audio version, check us out on your favorite podcast platform and follow Gators Breakdown on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. So 
Well, we, of course, we did hit uh, on it just a bit. Um, uh, one thing that come out of that national championship game, of course, is, and you kind of hit on it a little bit, is it's getting a little old that it's Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, uh, Oklahoma. <laughs> you know, most of the time as well as first year in a while, they haven't made it getting a little repetitive. The TV ratings were the lowest they have ever been for a college football playoff national championship game uh, as well. And it probably is getting a little monotonous uh, out there to, to the general college football fan. And you know, the thing is, if it was our team, we wouldn't, we wouldn't care <laughs> if it was Florida dominating like this, uh, you would tell well, everybody, you know, suck it up, catch up. Uh, and I'm sure that's how Alabama feel, fans feel uh, there. But uh, also one thing that, that came out of it, Will, and kind of a separate topic is um, I can't necessarily get on board with this. I tweeted it early this morning. It was like, you know, the last two years, Florida has played the eventual national championships, the toughest. And a lot of people taking a lot of, uh, you know, moral victory out of that. I, I, I can't find myself doing it, especially this year when you have three other losses and you can, you can approach the bowl game, the, the however you want, but the LSU game still inexcusable for how that happened. Texas A&M, you know, th- th- that game, yeah, it came down to a Malik Davis fumble, but also, you know, you let Texas A&M come back and, and, and storm back and, and take a victory uh, there in, 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 in that game. So while, you know, there is a lot of credit to give to Florida for playing Alabama so tough, you can't forget the other games. One, the exact, you know, a, a week before <laughs> the, Al- the Alabama game uh, with LSU and, and, and dropping that one and how that happened to a bad, bad LSU team. So uh, I, I get it. You know, maybe I'm being too critical. May I, maybe I'm being too pessimistic here. But, uh, yeah, I don't take a whole lot of moral victory in, in saying, well, if, you know, Florida played LSU very tough last year. We're on the right track. And, oh, we play Alabama very tough this year. We're on the right track. I can't forget the other losses. You shouldn't. I mean, I, I think I'm 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 on board with you there. I think one of the things that was refreshing about Mullen was when he came in, he took down the SEC East championship stuff that they had up in the stadium, and the message was pretty was pretty simple, which is that the SEC East isn't good enough. That the standard here at Florida is that you win for you win SEC championships, you win national championships, and you have Heisman Trophy winners, and that's who we put up statues for. That's who shows up in the Ring of Honor, and that's when you put something up on the stadium to celebrate it. We don't have any flags that you know we don't we don't have any banners up that say "Almost Beat Alabama" because that's embarrassing. You don't want to do that. You're a blue blood blue blood program, and you want to be competing with Alabama. Spurrier didn't beat Alabama every time, but when he lost to Alabama, he didn't then come in and say, "Well, we almost got him." Let's 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 celebrate. It's a moral victory. There was none of that stuff with Spurrier. There was definitely none of that stuff with Urban Meyer. Haven't heard that from Mullen yet, but if you start hearing that from Mullen, I'm going to be a little bit disturbed. Now, I think last year's LSU game told us something about what we had with Kyle Trask. And so the thing you could take out of the game last year against LSU was, hey, we've got a quarterback who can go on the road against a tough opponent in a really difficult environment and can play well, which gives us confidence going into 2020 that our quarterback situation is secure. And obviously, Trask took a step forward beyond what I think most of us thought he was going to do this year. The Alabama game, Emory Jones didn't come in there and show that he was the next big thing at the quarterback position. In fact, what what I would say is that most of the guys who played in that game are people who probably aren't going to be in Gainesville next year. And so at least the guys who played a large role in those games, Kadarius Tony, Kyle, Kyle Trask and Kyle Pitts and Trevon Grimes are all going to be gone. And so looking at that as a moral victory, I just like, no, you, you played them within six points and you lost at the end of the day, they keep a score. And if you end up with less points than your opponent, then, you know, too bad. It, it, it's just as bad as losing by 30. The other thing that everybody's conveniently glossing over is that that a and M team that Florida couldn't stop at all lost by the same 52 to 24 score to Alabama that Ohio state just did. <laughs> and so the transitive property doesn't necessarily work when it comes to college football. It, it's, the reason why a 10 and two team is ranked sixth and doesn't go in the playoffs versus an 11 and one team that maybe lost a game by a large margin does get in the playoff is because the two losses matter that showing up and being ready to play every week. And this is something that I think is really one of the remarkable things about Alabama is very rarely do they show up not ready to play. 
And this year, even more so. I mean, every game they won was by 15 plus points, except for against Florida. And that one could have easily been 15 points if the if the if the Trask fumble had been recovered when he went, or if Job hadn't been offsides on the Trask fumble, or you know, a couple of those fumbles that Florida was able to fall on had gone the other direction. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, you played yeah, well in the SEC. Me, it, it's, it doesn't it's tell me how close Florida is. No, I mean it's better to lose to Alabama fifty-two to to forty-six than it is to lose to them fifty-two to twenty-four. Right. But at the end of the day, they were still down thirty-five seventeen at the half, just like Ohio State. And just because Alabama maybe took its foot off the gas a little bit, and Florida was able to take advantage, and and Alabama learned from that and decided to put their foot down on Ohio State's throat and win the championship, um, you know, doesn't make the loss any better. So, look, I mean, the LSU game was inexcusable. It's one of those where you go, hey. If if you're going to call Alabama a moral victory, then you have to call LSU a moral failure. Yeah, <laughs> and just, exactly. Like it was awful, and everybody felt awful afterwards. And so consistency is required for a national championship. The last team to lose more than one game and win a national championship was LSU in 2007, and it required nine thousand things to go LSU's way in order for them to get into the BCS championship game. Those seasons don't come along very often, which means you got one shot. You can lose one game. And so when you end up eight and four, you're a lot further away from 11 and one or 12 and one than you are 13 and 0, like Ohio State was. And, you know, yeah, you can dismiss the Oklahoma game, but you can't dismiss the LSU game. You mm-hmm. can't dismiss the Texas AM game. And to be honest, you can't dismiss the games where Florida was 30 point favorites and won by two touchdowns. I know the whole year it was like, hey, we shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. It's the SEC winning by two touchdowns is a big deal. But Alabama won those games 63 to three. And that, if Alabama's the standard, if that's the team you got to beat to get to where you need to get to, then you need to emulate what they're doing. There are no moral victories in Tuscaloosa. If they'd have lost last night, they would have been ticked off and they would have had the the score of the game up on the wall the entire offseason. And that's what I hope happens. I hope they just run the LSU film all offseason long in the weight room. Every time those guys are in there, they should want to beat LSU by 70 points next year. And, and you know, hopefully they use it for motivation going into 2021. But, nah, no SEC East championship banners, man. I'm not, I'm not for it. Yeah, like uh, you can celebrate that in the moment because it's a great accomplishment. It was the next step for Florida. You beat Georgia, but then in the whole picture, and you know, I just saw it a whole lot last night. Oh yeah, this is how far this is how close Florida is because they played Alabama much tougher than Ohio State. I can't forget the other ones. I I, I can't. It, it doesn't work that way for me. And maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I'm cynical. I, I don't know. Maybe, but uh, I I put that out on Twitter. A lot of people did agree with it. You know, I, I did feel maybe I'm being a little pessimistic there. But I, you know, it's just just this is the way that I that, that I look at it. And I mean, I, I was happy with the way Florida played Alabama. I you know I walked out of that stadium with like, okay, you know, we we gave it a best shot, and it, it was close. But you know, still was it was still of the mindset of what could have been. You know, looking back just the week before and looking back at the 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 Texas A and M loss. Because put it this way, you beat Texas A and M, you beat LSU, you play Alabama the same exact way, you're in the playoff. <laughs> you far would have been in the playoff. So those inexcusable losses cost you a chance. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the thing, right? Is that you can, two things can be true at the same time. You can believe Florida had a season that showed progress. I think beating Georgia, getting over that hump, having an offense that couldn't be stopped, all those things are things that point towards progress. And we talked about coming into the year how a lot of coaches have third year dips, and Mullen really was sort of able to avoid that. I mean, obviously they finish eight and four, but if they'd, if they'd have tried in the, in the bowl game against Oklahoma, um, you know, maybe we're sitting here at nine and three and feel a little bit different. I think the Oklahoma loss and I, and I, puts, a, puts a different taste in my mouth. Right. And I hate hypotheticals too, but you play a normal season. Florida is probably a 10 and two team. Sure. But I mean, I, I think where they finished ranked at the end of the year, what they end up like 13th in the AP poll. Yeah. It's about right. Like this, mm-hmm. this team had the ability to beat anybody at any, any given time. Correct. And so if you take like, you know, if, if during a normal season, if the number two team is playing the number 14 team, like the number two team will win a large portion of the time, but at the same time, the 14 team still has a shot to, to beat them. And that's sort of where it is. I think Florida had a shot to beat anybody and play with anybody. The problem is, is that they didn't do that on a consistent basis. So, you know, that also meant that LSU had a shot to beat Florida and got it done. That meant AM had a shot to beat Florida and got it done. And if you really want to talk about moral victories, 
then you got to talk about the moral failure of they got absolutely just bulldozed by Najee Harris and they got bulldozed by Texas A&M. And to be honest, they got bulldozed by LSU too up front. And so the, um, you know, there, there's still work to be done. And that doesn't mean that this year was a failure. That doesn't mean that this year is a, is a giant problem or anything like that. What it means is that Florida has work to do. We know it. They're eight and four. They have work to do. And I'm not going to sit here and go, well, we've all, we almost took down Alabama. So that makes everything else better. No, you still got to fix the problems that caused you the losses at A&M against LSU and against Oklahoma, because let's be honest, those guys who are on the field against Oklahoma are going to be on the field next year. Mm -hmm. All right. And well, so, well, the thing is, okay, well, we will take a look at the, the final AP poll. Uh, you, you brought that up. I think we will go through, look at that, too. I got the coaches poll, too. Coaches poll came out uh, as well this uh, today. So, AP poll it finished up. You know, we have Florida knocking on the door uh, most of the season at a college football playoff, but ended up here 13th in the AP poll. Alabama, number one. No surprise, of course. Ohio State two, Clemson three, Texas A and M four. One of Florida's losses there uh, finishes. So you know, two of Florida's losses in the top four there. Notre Dame number five, Florida's other one of uh, Florida's other loss, Oklahoma number six. Georgia finishes the season seventh, one spot is in, ahead of Cincinnati, who they beat in the Peach Bowl. Iowa State at nine, Northwestern number ten, BYU eleven, Indiana twelve, then Florida at thirteen, Coastal Carolina at fourteen, Louisiana fifteen. So fourteen, fifteen. There's some newcomers uh, there uh, in, in the top twenty-five. Others of note here: uh, Miami finishes twenty-second uh, here in the coaches' poll. Florida finished one spot higher at number twelve. Uh, there, Texas a was number four in that one as well. Georgia seven in that one uh, too. But Florida was twelve uh, there, one spot behind BYU and in front of Indiana as well. So no surprise, Will. Kind of like you said, um, just about where I expected Florida to be um, after you know they what they were they didn't move it they didn't move at all right they they stayed at six after the SEC championship loss to, to Alabama I believe or they maybe fell to seventh maybe only yeah fell to one spot to seventh uh, but then uh, in college football playoff does not update their rankings they they just leave it as they are so the only final season polls you get are the AP and coaches in Florida thirteenth in twelve in those. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's pretty accurate in terms of what happened. You can't go out there and lose by 30 points or more than that to, to Oklahoma and expect <laughs> expect to be more than sort of a, a mid-tier program at the end of the day. I, again, I think we look back at the third years of McIlwain and Muschamp and say finishing in the top 15 is a, is a decent accomplishment. It's not where we want to end up, but it's not the end of the world, and so there are going to be some opportunities to fix things. Obviously, they've got some new coaches who are going to be coming in. And we'll see. I think the defense is going to have to take a step forward. I can't believe it would be worse than it was this year. And then I think the offense got a lot of work to do to replace Pitts and Tony and Trask. And uh, the nice part is, is it does look like they will be able to have spring practice. It does look like they will be able to uh, to get these guys full off seasons. Um, and, and if that happens, then I think maybe some of the things that we saw in terms of the complexity of Grantham's defense and people not being able to execute are going to – are going to sort of resolve themselves. And the other thing that it does is it gives Anthony Richardson an opportunity to really challenge Emory Jones for that starting spot because he's going to have a full spring and a full fall to show if he's better or not. And Emory's going to have to hold him off. And I think the the prevailing theme is that Emory's going to be starting quarterback, but you know we'll see. I don't know. Mullen tends to be sort of um, – in line with what he's promised people and those progressions, but you know, we'll see. I mean, obviously we saw how Richardson played in that game against Oklahoma, got everybody salivating a little bit. So it's going to be interesting to see what they can do with the spring game and the fall. Um, but I think coming into next year, you're probably, there's probably going to be some doubters, right? Cause there's a lot of people who are the main contributors for the Florida team are leaving. And the fact that they didn't replace Grantham and, and conceivably could not see progress on that side of the ball is going to make people hedge on Florida. Yep, we'll get into that too. Like I said, 2021, way too early polls are out. And we'll also get into our, uh, we'll look back at our 2020 preseason predictions and see how wrong we were. And we were wrong a lot <laughs> in, in that wheel. But before we get there, you know, it's that time of year when champions are crowned and legends are born and it's time for the NFL playoff and it's your time to win big. You've heard the name just about everywhere, my bookie. They're the industry's leading online sports book and conceded casino. And it's not hard to understand why with thousands of lines to bet on all your favorite sports. 
NFL, NBA, college ball, MMA, and soccer. They got all the latest odds, period. Take advantage of my bookie's prop builder and live in-game betting where every single run, throw, and touchdown is another chance for you to put cash in your pocket. Visit my bookie's mobile-friendly website today and get your deposit matched halfway up to 1000 bucks. Just use promo code GATERS when you make your first deposit. The best part is they make it simple with a variety of ways to deposit instantly, including credit card, bank transfer, Bitcoin, and more. Whether you're at home or on the go, on your laptop or on your phone, it's not too late to make your New Year's resolution a resolution to get paid. Bet, win, and get paid at my bookie using promo code GATERS. All right, Will, let's have some fun. We'll, we'll, we'll have some fun looking back at the uh, 2020 season and where we were right, where we were wrong, and looking at these over-unders. And look, you, we had to go into it saying 10 SEC games. So we had to modify the numbers a little bit. Far to play 12 games total uh, this season, if you count the SEC championship game and bowl game as well. So one, uh, we'll start off here, Trask, 30 touchdowns. So <laughs> this one, uh, you know, Trask only had 43 touchdowns, Will. <laughs> so, uh, you know, way off on that. I said he would not get 30 touchdowns. And – it was not a shot at him. I expected the run game to get better. I expected the run running backs to get some touchdowns. I expected Emory Jones to come in and get some short yardage touchdowns as well. It wasn't a shot at Trask. I just thought everybody around him was going to get better. And, you know, specifically the run game uh, to get some more rushing touchdowns. Uh, no, no. He went 13 over or 30 touchdown mark. <laughs> Yeah, this, this is this the, that old uh, the over under podcast from last year needs to go in the trash pile right next to our Chip Kelly podcast, <laughs> and uh, it really needs to uh, to go away. Because I went back and looked at what we did here, and just went oof, oof, oof. Like so, hopefully nobody gambled on any of this. Or next year, remember this, and whatever I say, gamble yes. the opposite direction. Because <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was in the same boat, right? As I thought they were going to use Emory Jones in a Tebow role a lot, like they had used before. I thought that. Um, Trask was going to play well. I just didn't think that, I mean, three touchdowns a game was a significant ask for somebody with an all SEC schedule. And then he came out and fired six against the old mess. And we were like, oh, well, I guess we were wrong on that one. Yeah. And then it turns out that Florida couldn't run the ball either. So, you know, right. you know we pretty much knew from game one. I think we were texting each other game one. It was like, yep, okay, we missed that one. <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, we missed on the defense, like we're going to talk about pretty soon, too. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, hey, look. It's a awesome thing when you're setting 30 touchdowns in a 10 game schedule and your quarterback blows by it. So um, I'll take being wrong on that one, obviously. But uh, I mean, that was the reasoning, right? The reasoning was we thought the rushing touchdowns were going to go to Jones. They didn't. They kept running quarterback keepers with trash out of the red zone. Um, you know, we thought that they were going to run a lot better when they were down the red zone. They didn't. Trash just threw the ball to Pitts every time they got down to the two yard line. And, uh, you know, and he had multiple opportunities to go for six touchdowns in a couple of games. And, and uh, you know, it's funny. When, when he wasn't being promoted for the Heisman, he was playing like a Heisman player. It almost felt like once the hype really started to catch up, that that was when the, the offense started to at least not sputter, but started to not be quite as deadly as it was before. Right, right, yeah. Um, we'll move on. Uh, Damian Pierce, we had 750 rushing yards here for Damian Pierce. He had 503 uh, on, on that. So the under, uh, I did hit the under on that. I said under because the, the running backs would you know split – Split the carries, uh, of course. We wouldn't have one dominant running back. I expected, as I just said, for the Kyle Trask part there, I expected a better run performance, but spread among many backs there. So did hit the under there for, for Pierce. I don't think that one was too hard, 750 rushing yards there. 503 is what Pierce ended up with. So nailed the under there. Yeah, so I had the over because I thought he was going to need a, at his av- at his per – at his yards per carry average from 2019, he was going to need 130 carries. And I thought he was going to get to 130 carries, and he almost did. And to be honest, had he averaged more than his 4.7 yards, I think he was at like 5.6 last year. If he'd averaged 5.6, he probably would have gotten the ball a lot more. The problem is he was getting hit like two yards in the backfield continuously and still was averaging five yards a rush. So, I mean, I think Pierce actually played pretty well considering mm-hmm. uh, considering what, what we have. But they did give 66 66- carries to Davis they gave 64 to Trask um, and then 54 to Naquan Wright and that's maybe the guy I didn't necessarily yeah. see stepping up y- you know Malik Davis had a history of being injured um, Naquan Wright we didn't really know what we had with him it turned out Naquan Wright and, and Malik Davis were just as good really in the running game as as Pierce and so like you said they split the carries there but he would have needed 160 carries this year at that 4.7 yards per per mm-hmm. attempt 
to get to 750. So he still could have gotten there if he'd have been the main back. But obviously they split the carries and the uh, offensive line struggled. And the offensive line was much better on the outside than it was on the inside. And you needed to be good on the inside for Pierce to Pierce to hit that number. Well, do you have the list there of everybody? Does do you have Tony's? How many how many carries did Tony have? Yeah, so Tony, nineteen carries, one hundred sixty one yards. Okay, okay, I knew it was around twenty. I just didn't remember. Okay, so yeah, you know, few few taken away there. Emery's taken some as well, not as many as we thought, but uh, yeah, there we go. So next one, Will was forty catches any pass catcher. So uh, you know, we did this one would nailed it uh, for the Pitts had forty three, even with missing some games, but leading the way. And by surprise was Kadarius Tony with 70 catches uh, on the season. We had 40 just because, you know, you, you look at the past years of, of Van Jefferson leading the team and it was right around, you know, that, that number, you know, that, that, that 40 number. And, you know, it, it was, it, it was even close. I mean, I don't think any, we didn't see Kadarius Tony because that was one of the biggest questions coming into the season was could, could Kadarius Tony be that true wide receiver Nobody in their right mind would have predicted seventy catches for Kadarius Tony. Hey, hey, hey! We need. We're. This is the only one I got right. So we, <laughs> we need to. And so there were two. There were two things that are over under that required some insight into Kadarius Tony, and I got both of them right. So this was one where I said we were going to be over big. That I was going. That two guys at least were going to have forty catches. There you go. And and I I thought it was going to be Pitts and Tony. I thought maybe Grimes would sneak in there too. He wound up with thirty eight. Um. You know, yeah, I mean, the, there aren't enough superlatives to talk about the way Tony played, especially the last three or four games of the year. I'll get into, um, I'll get into that when we get in kind of to the superlatives because he's on a he's on a bunch of mine. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I mean, hey, it, it's uh, I, I finally got one right. I'm uh, don't worry, none of the rest of them are right. So uh, <laughs> so we'll go from there. But yeah, the, the, Tony was great. I mean, for as good as Pitts was, and obviously getting the 43 catches with missing multiple games because of injuries um, is, is pretty significant as well. Because if he'd have been in those three games, he's probably up near that 70 catch mark as well. Offense, Will, 30 points per game. Uh, hit the over on, uh, on that as well. You know, in 2018, uh, just hit the over at 30.8 versus FBS opponents. Last, um, you know, 2019, 31.7 versus FBS opponents. Uh, and you know they Florida was averaging 33 points per game coming into the 2020 season to end 2019. So you know a little bit of an offense. You know it's a transition to Kyle Trask there and still able uh, to hit that uh, you know over 30 uh, points per game uh, average. No run game managed to do it again. Uh, 10 SEC games. I said give it to me anyway. Florida 39.8 points per game on the season that was thir- good for 13th in the country so almost a whole 10 points over points per game almost 40 points per game uh there for the Gators will yeah I I took this as a slight under mainly because of the SEC schedule I thought that uh my, my thinking was is that Florida had not averaged 30 points per game in Mullen's first two years in SEC play and so they were in order to get to 30, they were going to have to be better than they had been in 2018 and 2019. And obviously they were way better than they've been in 18 and 19. And and that's where that came from, but not thinking that Trask was going to make a jump from where he was to essentially Joe Burrow level. And, you know, I mean, hell you got to give him credit. I mean, to, to, to make that jump, especially without a running game, um, the offense carried this team, and I, I don't think either one of us thought that was the way this season was going to go. Certainly when we get into the defensive stats, we'll see that that's not how I thought it would go. <laughs> no, uh, defense, 21 points per game. I said I like the makeup of this defense. They have speed all over the field, and oh boy, that didn't uh, that didn't turn out too good. Um, they, did speed. they didn't line up right. Yeah, is that true? <laughs> uh, oh, man. So, uh, yeah, 21 points per game is where we set that at because in 2018, it was 22.2 versus FBS opponents. Did better in 2019, giving up only 18.3 versus FBS opponents. So, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, like I said, I like the makeup of this defense. I like the way they recruited. I thought that they had some athletic pieces in place. Oh boy! Did not expect the experienced guys to act like uh, true freshmen and and, and, and at, at, out there, not even knowing where to line up. So it was set at twenty one points per game. Florida gave up thirty point eight points per game. That was good for seventy fifth in the country. Will? Yeah, I had this. I said under by a lot, 
And my reasoning was I was expecting the D to be really good this year. And we're about to see what Grantham can do with his guys. And then it turns out he didn't put any of his guys on the field. It was all McElwain's guys who were playing. Shout, shout, out, to my, shout out to my buddy Colby C3 uh, uh, on Twitter. Cause he, he and I had that kind of conversation today. He was kind of, he's like, does recruiting even matter if we're not going to play you're not going to play those guys. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you go back. You're like, well, you know, Grantham had a – and I think this is true, and I even said it in my Grantham Review article after the year, which is that you know, if you just took seven – if you just took 18 and 19 in aggregate, you go, he's done an okay job, and now he's got his guys coming in, and let's see what he can do with his guys. Well, we saw that he didn't trust his guys, and he put McElwain's guys with a lot of experience in his system out there, and it turned into a disaster. So – um I am surprised he's coming back next year. I think my expectation was the team was going to go up 16 or 17 points a game. Obviously, if they'd have done that, we'd be having a very different conversation because it probably wouldn't be moral victories against Alabama. It would be, wow, that rematch with Alabama in the championship game was really cool um, and just didn't happen this year. Defense couldn't hold its weight, and boy um, – I think both of us expected to sort of have a trademark salty Florida defense, and yeah. it just didn't happen at all. Didn't happen at all. Um, one number that we always look at for this over under two that we have a lot of fun with is sacks, and we set that number at 35. Even with less games, we usually go with 30, but we raised it up with less games, give them five more, 35. They hit that right on the dot. Florida went up to a push there, uh, hit 35 sacks. You know, that's after 37 in 13 games in 2018. 49 in 2019 so yeah we of course we were going to raise the number of 35 and just uh you know 10 11 12 games for the gators but even 12 games there uh they only hit 35 there so we'll definitely uh yeah they, i don't remember if they ended the season leading the sec in sacks or not i know they led the sec most of the season uh there but still even with leading the sec most of the season um it still wasn't the, the pressure we remember from Jacob Light and Jonathan Grenard and, and, and uh, Jabari Zuniga uh, throughout the last couple of years. And you know, it, it was good. It was good, but it wasn't the, the dominant pass rush that we had seen the couple, last, last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, it was really the the they needed 45 sacks and a bunch of quarterback pressures yeah. to make up for the issues on the backside of the defense and weren't necessarily able to get that. And again, if you go back to the games where – Florida really struggled. The LSU game, the AM game, and the Alabama game, there really wasn't a whole lot of pressure mm -hmm. in those. So, you know, you get a bunch of sacks against Matt Corral and Ole Miss, that's great. But, you know, the Grantham trademark is, is that you play the big boys like Georgia and LSU and Alabama, and you can't get to the quarterback, and we saw that again this year. Absolutely, absolutely. So kind of superlatives here. Ultimate game changer, Kadarius Tony nailed that one. I didn't think we'd nail it as much as we did <laughs> uh, there. I mean, that was just uh, – Look, I mean, that, that one was simple when you go back and look at the season. Uh, on defense, I went Britton Cox. Uh, I said I expected him to have a polite type of impact here. Big sacks on third downs, hitting the backfield, causes havoc and turnovers. Didn't necessarily get that. He was oh, look, kind of going back to the sack conversation here. He was an okay guy. Uh, didn't necessarily have the the big game-changing sacks that, we, that we've seen the last couple of years. Uh, living in the backfield over and over, play after play uh, there. So we didn't get that on uh, on defense there. So – um, he was okay at creating pressure, but nothing special there. Played out of position early on in the season. Did get better once uh, Kyrie Campbell come back, and he could rush off the edge a bit more uh, there. But offense will, pretty simple there. It was Kadarius Tony. Yeah, it's interesting that uh... – you know, if you look back on who was the ultimate game changer this year for Florida, especially on the defensive side of the ball, it probably was Kyrie Campbell. And I think that's probably a, a microcosm of the Florida defense. It's when yeah. your defensive tackle is the ultimate game changer for your defense, then that really probably means the rest of your defense isn't playing very well. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I think you could say Trask on the offensive side of the ball as well, right? Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, whenever you got a guy who's playing for the Heisman Trophy, I mean, Tony obviously played great, but, uh, but Trask would have fit that mold too. Absolutely. Absolutely. He would have. Best tandem. Do I really have to say this out loud? Uh, I believe I said Marco and Elam <laughs> We're going to be the uh, the best tandem. I said, you know, we, we recorded this recorded this the week of. They were both named all SEC second team by SEC. Way off there, way off. The best tandem, and it's not even close. And you know, for for Florida anyway, and because this is one of the nation's best tandems, Tony and Pitts. That, that's what it ended up being. 
Yeah, I think so. I said for this one coming into the year, I said Trask and Emory Jones. And yeah. to be honest, it was the best tandem. They just never let Emory play. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best tandem all because of uh, yeah, all because of Trask. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think the other place maybe where you would say best tandem for the team was um, was Pierce and Davis, not because necessarily the run game worked so well, but because of the way those guys were able to operate in the pass game. Um, you know, we got to win over Georgia this year, which is something I don't think we want to overlook. And one of the reasons that we were able to get a win over Georgia is because of those wheel routes that Kirby's going to be seeing as nightmares all all off season long. So, um, you know, and we're I, glad you said that because we did talk about it during the season a bit. But we, my biggest question, and I asked the coaching staff b- before the season a whole lot, who is going to replace Lamichael P. Ryan? in the passing game as a running back. And Florida had more than one, had more, more than one running back do that. Turned out it was all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, breakout player. I said, Mamou Diabate. Um, somewhat, I guess you could put that there. He wasn't the ultimate breakout player for the team. Uh, though I, you know, I expected the way he ended 2019, uh, to come. Kind of, and I think he played out of position a little bit. I thought we saw him get more comfortable at that linebacker role, uh, there, but I expected him more off the edge a bit than we, than we got to see uh, in 2020. But the breakout player, and I know he was a name for Gator Nation for most. And I told you we was going to hear his name a lot when I started giving out these superlatives. Kadarius Tony, on a national scale, he was the breakout player for Florida. I and mean, like I said, the 70 catches, the touchdowns, the important catches, being able to run routes, completely transforming his game. He was the true definition of a breakout player. Well, hey, I got another one right. This was the one that I predicted <laughs> coming in. I, you know, blind squirrel gets an acorn every once in a while. This was one you could actually see going back. And when you really look at it, so in 2017 in that McElwain offense that was just awful, he averaged 9.4 yards per touch. Then then Mullen comes in, he averages 10.9 yards per touch on 46 touches, 25 receptions, 21 rushing attempts, but 10.9 yards per touch. And then last year he got or in 2019 he got hurt. 22 total touches, but still averaged 11 and a half yards per per touch. This year he had 89 touches and averaged 12.9 yards per touch. So he was much more effective in the passing game, which is why that average went up. But at the same time, they just decided they were going to get him a bunch of touches. And it's not as though in 2018 and 2019 when they gave him the ball, the offense didn't go. In fact, I can remember writing about why is Kadarius Tony not on the field back in 2018 that they weren't getting him the ball enough. So that was sort of the 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 rationale that I was using in terms of picking him as the breakout player. And and all credit to him for getting out there and being consistent enough that they could get him the ball. But at the same time, um, you know, he's shown flashes of this throughout his entire time at Florida. And while they didn't put him at quarterback while I like I wanted early, you know, back in 2018, I think uh, um, obviously he's proven that I think he's going to make the money that proves that moving him to wide receiver was the right call because uh, he's, he's going to get paid going to the league. All right, here we go. No respect. I went preseason. I went Ventral Miller because he was going to have to take over for David Reese. And, and okay job. Um, not, um, you know, uh, I kind of went to oh, he's not gonna he's not getting the respect because you know he's playing middle linebacker he's got to replace David Reese there and you know there's a lot on this plate there so I don't think enough respect was going to be given uh, to the middle linebacker and then the leadership that uh, David Reese had I thought we kind of have to be you know Ventura Miller has to kind of pick that up um, and uh, I don't think uh, going into the season that uh, that that replacing David Reese was going to getting enough respect there for Ventura Miller. But looking back at it, I'm going to go to Stone Forsyth. Uh, for, for as bad as this offensive line was uh, at, at points, we know the right side and Delance is and, and Reese's trouble. Delance, you know, pass blocking. At least that was in the face of Kyle Trask. He could see that pass rush coming. He could make some moves to get away from it. He didn't have to worry about his blind side. You know, Kyle Trask, for, 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 for all the yards and touchdowns that he threw up, a lot of that to me was because of the confidence that he had that he wasn't going to get hit in the back. So, you know, no respect, no respect just because he's an offensive line. And I'm going to give him the respect here. I'm going to give uh, Stone Forest that's a whole, a whole lot of respect, you know, for, for helping uh, keep uh, Kyle Trask upright, for he, him to throw the ball down the field for a lot of yards and a lot of touchdowns. Yeah, so this is the one where I went with the secondary, and so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna I would look stupid. My my no respect was Donovan Steiner and Trey Dean. I had two of them, and obviously that that sort of crashed and burned. And Steiner really really struggled back there this year, and then Dean even I, I think started to play a little bit better towards the end, and maybe you could, maybe you could say that. Um, you and know, Gator Nation missed it. He did announce today he's coming back for one more yeah. year. 
Yeah, so we'll see what happens next year with with him playing safety full time. Certainly, if he holds on to that ball after he got ear holed by Mechie mm. um, after the interception, and that maybe that game against Alabama is a lot different, and maybe we have a different perception as to how valuable Dean was for the team this year. But it did take him about half the year to get his way into the into the lineup. And then, like I said, Steiner has had been consistent his first three years. He'd been consistently sort of average. He was not a standout player, but he was not a massive liability. And this year he was just a massive liability back there and really, really was, uh, you know, a lot of bad angles, a lot of catches made over him and, and not necessarily helping facilitate, um, you know, the other areas in the secondary that were struggling as well. And obviously it was a group effort in terms of struggling, but uh, you're not going to hear me saying that he played well back there this year. (laughs) <laughs> absolutely best kept secret will uh we go i think i went with malik davis two years in a row <laughs> there so okay you know it, it, he played okay this year but i think it was Kadarius tony as i said uh, uh you're gonna hear his name a lot for me i just didn't expect what we saw this year to, to, to happen I, mean, I, I was a big Kadarius tony fan but you know 70 catches I and mean, if you would have told me 40 50 you probably could have talked me into that I would have never guessed that many catches. I did, I, and I wanted him to show me that he could be a wide receiver because I thought he had the ability to do it. But you know, with the, with, with the pandemic and not being able to go to spring practice and not being able to go and throw with Kyle Trask and it late late nights in the facility, could he put the, all that to use? And look, he put it upon himself to come out there and, and be a true wide receiver. And you, you heard Kadarius Tony's name. Uh, almost every Gator game out there. So he was no, he he was the best kept secret that got out during the season for defense. Uh, I, th- I think Zach Carter. Uh, he's going to return back for one more year as well. Uh, I think uh, as we go back and look at this, uh, probably when he was on the field and healthy and play, and probably overall the best player on defense. Will yeah. So I had the best kept secret coming into the year, Amari Bernie. And I really thought he was going to be the guy who stepped into the role sort of vacated by David Reese, not necessarily because he was going to be the middle linebacker, but because he was going to be so versatile at the linebacker position that he was going to allow Florida to do a bunch of different things on defense. And it turns out the guy who wound up stepping into that role was Diabate. Mm -hmm. And I I think if you're looking for best kept secret, um, Diabate wasn't going to show up on any all SEC list this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up on a few all SEC lists next year coming into the preseason had two, force fumbles he he defended a pass he had an interception against Kentucky that was that was pretty impressive he had 67 tackles seven tackles for loss and really being able to sort of roam out there and then turn on the jets and get to the quarterback really really quickly um and his ability to defend um to defend running backs coming out into space I I think that there's going to be a huge role for him next year in the defense and he's probably going to be the best kept secret coming into coming into 2021 yeah, it's kind of fast forward to our next one, all intangible. I went Amari Bernie for because a lot of those reasons that you just specified there. They'd be able to line him up in a couple spots. Uh, he'd be a fast linebacker on the field. That's because I was, you know, kind of high on the defense at the time and playing these tweeners that didn't turn out so good uh, there. I didn't think we we could put a, enough value on Amari Bernie being able to to have that speed at linebacker, but he could also cover and all that kind of stuff there. Uh, really, really struggled. He got better as the season went on a bit. He struggled really mightily at the beginning of the season, but he just still met with the media, still took a whole lot of brunt uh, of the force there uh, there for Amari Bernie. But, well, I'm going all intangible. I'm going Kyle Trask, uh, just the things you could not teach. Uh, and that's what so, you know, is in, so intangible about him, I think. Waited his time, elevated his game, set a good example of patience. You know, I never blame players for transferring or, or, or label them as quitters in that regard. I don't think that way. You know, some guys just need a fresh start. And we're seeing that a lot in college football now. Nobody wants to sit on the bench. They want to they want to go play uh, there. But, you know, most of the time it is best to move on when you, when you have that mindset there. But this, you know, this kid stuck it out and set a great example there. So, you know, the, the, the intangible for me for, for Kyle Trask, patience, waiting his time, and then going out there and showing it on a national stage week in and week out. Yeah, for some reason I didn't write this one down, so maybe okay, I. Either, but but it doesn't really matter because I would have gotten it wrong anyway. So uh, <laughs> if I was, to be honest, if I'm going to pick the guy who maybe impressed me with his intangibles the most this year, it's funny we've talked about him the entire podcast, but it's Tony. Yeah. It, it, the the way he played against LSU, and just if Florida had won that game, he would have been the guy that you said he was the best guy on the field that night. Mm -hmm. And I think you could say that about the game against Alabama. 
And, you know, it's conceivable if they pull out a couple of those games, you're saying that in a playoff game as well. And, you know, when he got hit late in that game against LSU, where they, you know, had like 15 seconds to get the ball in the field goal range, he was limping around out there and really struggling and still ran a little 10 yard curl for, for Trask to hit him to get him within, um, within Evan McPherson's field goal range. And, you know, they almost pulled that one out because of Tony, because once that fog rolled in, Florida didn't have anything other than hand the ball to Tony for a 30 yard gain and throw the ball to Tony as he's running across the field. Other than that, they couldn't really move the ball. And, uh, you know, just the toughness that he showed in both the, uh, in both the LSU and the Alabama games really impressed me. Yeah, there and and his progression, and I'll, I'll say I'll hit it one more time. You know, just being being a wide receiver, he he did the other things that we knew that he could do, but he also put one more piece of the puzzle in his game and, and, and become a true wide receiver, and, and you know one of Florida's best playmakers there, along with Kyle Pitts. Uh, biggest shoes to fill, I said Travon Grimes, of course, with all those receivers uh, out there. It turned out to me. Just because of a leadership role, and we didn't see a whole lot of leadership on defense, I think Ventrell Miller, a lot of people look to your middle linebacker to be that leader on defense. And we, I think Florida missed that leadership from David Reese. Um, you know, and, and also, I think we could also say Cox, you know, and trying to replicate the production of Grenard, Zuniga, and Polite's production. Talked about it br- briefly uh, there when we were talking about the sack numbers there. But big issues to fill. I went into the season with Trevon Grimes. He, I think he lived up to the label. Along with Kyle Pitts, Kyle um, uh, Kadarius Tony, uh, you know you had some big plays there during the season from Jacob Copeland and Justin Shorter uh, as well. Uh, there, so the wide receivers, you know, Trevon Grimes in that group, you would have thought just because of what Florida lost last year, those would have been the biggest shoes to fill. But to me, it turned out to be uh, Ventro Miller. Yeah, so it's interesting. Coming into the year, the biggest shoes to fill that I had was LaMichael P. Ryan. And I think Malik, Malik Davis did a really good job of doing that. I mean, you got Tony with 70 catches. You got Pitts with 43, Grimes with 38. And the next guy on that list is Malik Davis with 31. And it wasn't like he was catching little screen passes and going for four yards on checkdowns. I mean, he averaged 12.2 yards per t- per catch, um, which is right around where, you know, Trent Whittemore and, and Keon Zipper are. Um, you know, we're able to do the other guy on, on offense. You might actually highlight is, is Kamora Gamble being able to step up in that Georgia game when Kyle Pitts went down. Um, certainly I think Florida missed Pitts in that LSU game, but you know, they didn't miss Pitts in that small stretch between when he went out against Georgia and, and when he came back against who was it, Tennessee. Um, yeah. you know, but before, in the meantime, Gamble and Zipper were really able to hold their own, and I think sort of bodes well for for twenty twenty one. That yeah, you're going to miss Kyle Pitts, right? I mean, he's a, he's a generational player. I'm not saying that we're not going to miss him, but it does make me feel better to know that there are guys on the team who were able to step up, step into his shoes, and at least um, bring value to the offense at the tight end position. All right, all right. That's our look back at 2020. Will we'll we'll do it all out again in August, and we'll have some fun, and uh, we'll do it again, and then uh, hopefully we're we're more right next year. And it's uh, and it's good numbers too. Yeah, that, that lead to a successful Florida season. <laughs> hey, all I know is if if you went to my bookie and bet against me, you made a lot of money this year. So just remember <laughs> that for next year. All right, Will. Let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, we don't have to fast forward too much because you know these, these are called way too early early polls. I mean, way too early polls there that, that are thrown out. I, I gathered five of them. I thought that would be a good round kind of number that to, to go along here. ESPN, Athlon, 24-7, The Athletic, and Saturday Down South are the, the five that I chose there, Will. Uh, and we'll start with ESPN. Uh, and they rank Florida. This is the next to the, next to the lowest Florida would be ranked in these five. Florida is ranked 16th in ESPN's top 25 uh, poll. Let me pull it up here. And of course, you know, no surprise. A lot of these, the top, you know, and when people are saying, you know, everything looks kind of monotonous uh, for, for college football right now, this is part of it as well. Is It's the same teams <laughs> year in and year out that you see uh, at the top of these polls here. ESPN has Clemson number one for 2021, Alabama number two, Oklahoma three. Uh, you know, they're going to kind of building off of their late season performance in Cotton Bowl win versus Florida. Georgia number four, Ohio State number five, Texas A&M number six there for ESPN, North Carolina at number seven, Iowa State at eight, USC at nine, Indiana at 10, Cincinnati down to 11, Iowa Hawkeyes at 12, Oregon 13, 
Washington 14, Notre Dame, a college football playoff team this year, all the way down to 15, and the Florida Gators at 16. And here's the outlook here from Mark Slayball of ESPN. He goes, Florida's breakthrough season under Coach Dan Mullen ended with a big flop as the Gators lost their last three games, including a 55-20 to route against Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl. Most of Florida's offensive fire, firepower is departing, including Heisman Trophy, Heisman Trophy finalist Trask. Sophomore Embry Jones looks like the quarterback of the future, and the Gators will have to identify reliable pass catchers with Pitts, Grimes, and Tony departing. The defense will also need a major facelift after it was gutted for 144 points and more than 1,700 yards of offense in those last three late losses. The Gators allowed 28 touchdown passes this season, which ranked next to last among FBS teams. 28 touchdown passes allowed by this Gator defense this past year. And that was next to last among FBS teams. Gave up 30.8 points per game. Their most since surrendering 41.2 per contest in six games in 1917. Todd Grantham, one of the highest paid defensive coordinators in FBS, seems to be on thin ice. Secondary coaches Ron English and Torian Gray have been fired. So that's what Mark Slayball there has to say for ranking the Gators 16th on ESPN and can't disagree with any of it, Will. A lot of it was stat-based. <laughs> you know, we do a lot of stats here, and a lot of it was kind of confirmed. But I didn't know that that many touchdown passes was next to last in the FBS. Oof. So, yeah. yeah I mean, you can kind of see why Florida, in, in, in the way they explain it here on ESPN, has Florida ranked 16th. Well, I mean, we watched it every week. We saw how terrible it was. Maybe, yeah. we, didn't, maybe we didn't know, or at least we hadn't had it quantified in our minds, but we'd certainly seen that. I, I think uh, – um, you know, the unknown at quarterback is the thing that I think makes everybody hesitant. I mean, certainly I, I guarantee you there's going to be multiple people who think JT Daniels is going to win the Heisman Trophy next year. I actually thought he was going to play really, really well this year if they'd have played him to start with. And so, you know, the the normal players are going to get in there. And, and the uncertainty at quarterback in certain places, you know, for Clemson, like the fact that is it Yui Agalele? Is that how he pronounces his name? DJ Yui Agalele for, uh, for Clemson is going to jump in for Trevor Lawrence, but he was able to jump in for Trevor Lawrence against Notre Dame and they still put up 40 points and he like threw for 450 yards and and played really well in the other game that Lawrence missed as well. So I think it says something about the Heisman balloting though, is that everybody gave that, gave the award to, to or gave Lawrence the career award, but yeah. his stats were worse than Trask's. And when you had Yui Agalele jump in, like it's not as though the stats went down. And, and so it is an interesting sort of commentary on the the program that Dabo has won that ever or that, that Dabo's built that everybody believes that they're going to win again next year. Um yeah, I, I'm not sure you can argue with with where they have Florida. The, the nice part is is that the expectations are you're going to be a top 15 team, you're going to lose three or four games. And so since those are the expectations, you go 10 and 2 and you're going to you're going to outperform those expectations, everybody gets excited. Yep, uh, LSU was twentieth there in the ESPNs there. So I'm, I'm going to put Bama, Georgia, and LSU in the in this comparison as well because Florida plays Alabama, Georgia, and LSU for the 2021 season here. Athlon um, has the Gators 13th, but no surprise if you look at the top there as well. Familiar. Here we go: Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, Georgia, Ohio State. The same five, just a little bit of different order there for the top five uh, there. You're going to get that in almost every poll here. As, we, as I said, we'll scroll down. To, they have Notre Dame in, in the top ten as well. But uh, So Athlon a bit higher on Florida and Notre Dame here uh, for the, their top 25. But they do have Florida at number 13, and I'll read their blurb too. It'll be the last one I read as we finish up the rankings here. It says the Gators are coming off their first SEC East title uh, since 2016, but Coach Dan Mullen's team has a lot of work to do in order to get back to Atlanta. An offense that averaged 7.3 yards per play and 39.8 points a game has to replace Kyle Trask, Kadarius Toney, Kyle Pitts, and Trevon Grimes. Emory Jones is a front runner to replace Trask with Anthony Richardson also in the mix. Jones brings a different skill set to the offense, but Mullen's track record shows there won't be a drastic drop in production. Clemson transfer Demarcus Bowman would push for snaps in the talented backfield. The line will need to be retooled with four senior starters if they don't opt to return for an extra year. The Gators hope to get back on track defensively after surrendering 6.1 yards per play and 30.8 points per game, but question marks remain. Tackle Kyrie Campbell, Marco Wilson, cornerback Marco Wilson are off to the NFL. Uh, you know, 
Wilson not big loss there. Uh, but more help is needed at linebacker, and a couple seniors could head into the next level instead of returning for an extra year. Quarterback Kyrie Elam and lineman Brenton Cox and Zachary Carter will lead the effort to improve next fall, and Penn State transfer Antonio Shelton is a big boost to the interior. Florida gets Alabama at home and is on the road against LSU and crossover play with the SEC West, but also faces trips to Missouri and Kentucky. The annual showdown versus Georgia takes place on October 30th in Jacksonville. Athlon also has LSU 23rd, so 10 spots uh, below Florida there. So we're a little more optimistic here. Uh, you know, the kind of key takeaway from Athlon, you know, no trash, but Jones comes in and then follows that up with more or less track record shows there won't be a drastic drop in production. Offense will definitely be different next year. <laughs> we'll talk all offseason about it, uh, of course, coming up in the coming weeks and months uh, as we preview the season uh, here. But, you know, that, that's going to be the, the 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 basis of everybody's ranking of Florida. Uh, look, last year it was it, it was top ten for the most part, top five in a, in, in a lot of rankings uh, here. But you're, you're not going to find Florida in many top tens this year because of what you lose on offense and having to fix a pretty terrible defense. Yeah, well, and and because of what we saw from the freshman classes. So when you look at the all SEC teams, they tend to build from teams that are from players that were all were freshmen all SEC. A lot of times the freshmen all SEC are sort of the basis for those classes that build into programs that have successful seasons. So the only guy on Florida's team who could potentially be who would have been on the freshman all sec team last year is if they happen to get eric gilbert from lsu through the transfer portal other than that there's nobody on the freshman all sec team who played for florida this year and so they're they're your usual suspects a couple from georgia a couple from alabama the teams i think you got to watch out for at least when you look at these lists are arkansas and mississippi state they both have three or four guys on that freshman team AM has like one, Kentucky has one. So, you know, nobody on Florida's side that's really going to be jumping out. But, uh, um, you know, Florida also, it's not like there's this band of reinforcements. And I think if you look at like the, a lot of people have compared this defense, and in fact, I have in, at times to the 2007 defense. But the difference was is that guys like Joe Hayden and, and other players were on that freshman all SEC team, even though the defense struggled. There's none of that really coming. The reinforcements are going to have to come through the transfer portal, or they're just going to have to guys have guys step up in their sophomore seasons who didn't get an opportunity to play. Now, maybe that happens because COVID was weird. We didn't have spring practices. Mullen tends to rely on older guys. But one of the things you'd be looking for if you're trying to predict Florida having a season that's better than what these guys are predicting is that uh, you know that they've got sort of reinforcements from the youth coming in, and that just you know the guys who played who were young weren't good enough to be making these freshmen all SEC teams. And to be honest, I'm hard pressed to really think of a freshman who came in, especially on the defensive side of the ball and made a major difference. I mean, you could talk maybe Richard Torrance or Trevez Johnson contributed. Bourbon makes her played pretty good toward the end of the year. But I mean, he played his best, he played his best game versus Alabama. Sure. So, I mean, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the hope, but that I think is where these sort of ratings come from is there's nothing where you look back and go, well, they had three guys who played inconsistently, but really well as freshmen. And once they become consistent, they're going to be really, really good. You sort of look at it and go, they didn't have any answers and they didn't bring in these freshmen to play when they didn't have any answers from the seniors. And so what does that say about the freshmen? And I think that's why you've got people having the trepidation that they do on the defensive side of the ball, especially. Absolutely there. So uh, 24-7, uh, the highest out of all of these polls have Florida 11th there. So uh, Alabama number one, Georgia number four, LSU 21st uh, there. Uh, the Athletic had Florida all the way down that 17. So 24-7 had Florida the highest at 11. The Athletic the lowest for Florida at number 17. Alabama was number one in that as well. Georgia was number four again in that one. Georgia's been number four in every poll uh, so far here uh, so uh, in all these. But the Athletic had LSU as a top ten team. Had LSU at number nine uh, there for the Athletic. Saturday down south had the Gators 12th. They had Alabama number two. They had Georgia number three in that one and LSU uh, 15th. So, uh, well, I took the average of all these five polls just to kind of get a feel uh, for what everybody would be looking at in, in these polls. Look, I did all these. I look, went around and looked at all these polls so you guys out there don't have to. So I did all the, I did all the, all the research for you here. Uh, Bama, of course, averaged the, the top spot, number one. 
Georgia averaged around four uh, there, and then LSU averaged uh, top 17 uh, in all these five polls here between ESPN, Athlon, 24-7, The Athletic, and Saturday Down South. And after ranking these five polls, it was 14th for Florida. So, you know, all this after where Florida was, you know, firmly in the top 10 last year, as I said, even top five in a lot of the uh, way too early polls last year. Um, and look, we saw Will, and I think – Going back and, you know, kind of we'll wrap it up here with the way we looked at 2020 just now. Go back and kind of these way too early polls. We did this last year as well. You take it all together and top 10, top five heading into this past season and why we saw it as the window to strike. Similarly to, to, to LSU in 2019, you knew they weren't going to have a, a, the, the sustained success but they found lightning in a bottle in 2019, and that's the the way a lot of us looked at it for for 2020 for Florida. You know, we a lot of us expect you know this mild fall for Florida for 2021, a tougher schedule to go along with losing Kyle Trask and Kyle Pitts and and all, all the weapons on offense. And now we didn't expect this defense heading into 2020, but now you got you got that to fix as well. Bama's Bama. Georgia will be good and have a better offense. We'll see how their defense shakes out. But they've recruited too good you know, to, to take a major step back. LSU's making coaching changes and recruited well and, and, and ended the season on a high note. Now, Florida's mostly a top 15 team in these preseason rankings, and, and, and the games must be played. Uh, but with a, with, a, with a better team and, and other teams around you uh, not as good or or you know, even better, you, ba- you basically ended – it's basically where you ended this season. I, I guess what I'm just saying, where, where Florida's projected to be next year around 14th, you know, that's Florida's starting next year, basically in the, in the same spot. And 2020 was supposed to be the year. 2020 was supposed to be the year to put it all together and go make a college football playoff run. And kind of that's why the disappointments there, everything was built up to 2020. You end 12th and 13th. And look, we don't, we, it's, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to play out this way, but in 2021, you look at it and you're 14th right around where you ended 2020. Yeah. I think you need to take a little, these rankings a little bit with a grain of salt, right? So in, two, in 2018, Florida was unranked and rightfully so after the 2017 debacle. <laughs> and then Mullen was able to pull out a top 10 season. And then last year I would bet or 2019 now, not last year, 2019, I would bet that we were rated somewhere in that 10 to 15 range and wound up with a top, five, I think, or top six ranking. And then this year people said, Hey, if they got to top five or top six before, then what will they, what will they be able to do this year? And, and if Florida had, let's say Florida had missed the sec championship game, had managed to pull it out against that, or maybe even lost LSU, right? So you're eight and two and you don't get the loss to Alabama and you play, you actually show up in the bowl game and you go nine and two. Well, you're in that range again. So we're really sort of splitting hairs around where people are. The concern that I have is that Alabama is going to be good again because Alabama is always good. Georgia's going to, it looks like Georgia has a quarterback. And the thing I'm concerned about is it looks like LSU might have a quarterback too. Max Johnson played really well, played reasonably well against Florida and then played really well in their finale. And if they found a quarterback, we've already seen what can happen to LSU when they have a quarterback. And again, I go back to those all SEC freshman lists. Kayshawn Butte at wide receiver, who just drove Florida crazy, makes the all SEC team. They've got BJ Ojolari on the defensive line. They've got Eli Ricks at DB on those SEC all freshman teams. So they do have the young guys who are who are ready to step in. So even though you look at LSU and said they had a down year this year, if Max Johnson ends up being a above average quarterback with the level of talent that, that Ed Orgeron has been able to bring in, even with Eric Gilbert transferring out, I still think that that's going to be a team where 17 is probably the lower end of what I would expect to see from them next year. And, and Mike uh, Johnson did that without Gilbert. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, he was playing with a skeleton crew against Florida. So to come into the swamp and beat Florida, you know, he's going to be flying high coming into next year. And he did show a lot of ability. Now, Florida's defensive backs made him look really good in some respects. I mean, obviously, when you send a double corner blitz and don't guard the wide receiver, I'm not sure that you necessarily credit Johnson for that. But you do credit him for finding the guy and you credit him for being able to put together some of those longer drives. And, and you know, hey, look, you got to tip your hat to him because he won the game. So I think LSU is probably going to be better than that i think georgia especially because they're going to take on clemson early on um you know if that if that becomes if that ends up being an ugly loss to clemson 
then I think Florida or I think Georgia falls pretty significantly down from there. So that's maybe their first major test. Um, I do think that getting over the hump against Georgia, you know, we, we've fallen behind against Georgia in all three years of the Mullen regime. And this year, Florida was able to come screaming back. You wonder whether after getting that monkey off of their back will allow them to come out a little bit more relaxed against Georgia and that game will be competitive. Even if Florida's a worse team this year the, in 2021, are they going to be a little bit more competitive because they don't come out sort of tight and, and yeah. spot Georgia 10 or 14 points like they have the last three years? Um, you know, and, and then Emory, the reality is, is Emory Jones may end up being an unbelievable quarterback. He is a really good runner. And we haven't seen what he can do in the passing game yet, at least not extensively, because they haven't let him do very much. And the running game opens up so much. And it allows you to, to play ball control if you want to. I mean, one of the things about Florida is it was like bam, 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 down the field and score. There were a few times where they had like seven and a half, eight minute drives, but not always. And being able to give the defense a blow, being able to um, really sort of impose your will on the other team. That 2008 team, 2018 team was one that really leaned on teams in the fourth quarter and relied on Nick Savage and all the strength and conditioning to win the fourth quarter. 2019 was the same way. This year, Florida lost the fourth quarter pretty consistently mm -hmm. in all those games they lost. And you do wonder, again, if they have that LSU game sort of rolling in the in the, in the weight room when they're all working out, a full off season with Savage, will that make a difference? Because Florida, for all of the warts that we talk about from a recruiting perspective, is going to end up with the 10th or 11th most talented roster in the country when it all boils down. So, I mean, you know, when they're playing teams like Kentucky and Tennessee and and Mississippi State, they should win those games. It's the it's the games against Alabama and and uh, and Georgia. And maybe that's the other reason to have Florida at fifteenth is Florida does have to play Alabama this year during the regular season, yep. which means you know if you look at who they're going coming into this year, you said they'd probably be underdogs against Georgia, and that was it. And then Alabama in the SEC championship game. That was where you figured they would be underdogs. This year, I think they're probably going to be underdogs against Georgia. I think they'll be underdogs against Alabama. Um, and depending upon how the teams are playing, by the time LSU comes, or I guess that game would be in Baton Rouge, by the time that by the time Florida goes to Baton Rouge, you know, it may be that uh, that Florida will be an underdog in that one too. So I, that Alabama game, I think, really sort of throws where people think Florida's going to going to wind up because if you lose two games, um, that's pretty much how we looked at Georgia this year. Yeah, yeah. They they had to play Alabama. You felt Florida was, you know, at least on equal footing. Man, the tiebreaker was going to be well. They got to play Alabama, so <laughs> Florida will, Florida will at least make up, you know, a loss there. So um, yeah, so we don't have that hiccup this year. So right. it's it's going to take a real performance by the guys who are stepping up in order to in order to continue and win the East again. Doesn't mean it can't happen. But, uh, you know, this year I think it was maybe a 50-50 proposition. I know when you had Robbie and and uh, some of the Georgia guys on during the offseason, they were pretty nervous about Florida being able to take down Georgia in 2020. Um, I, I suspect if we have them on during the offseason headed into 2021, they'll be a little bit more uh, willing to take my bet about coming on and singing the uh, singing the opposition's fight song if, there's, if, if our teams win. <laughs> Yeah, like as I said, you know, and that's why you got to strike. Uh, you know, twenty twenty was that window to strike, and and now um, you go take your chances in twenty twenty one. But uh, a lot of changes, a lot of changes on the skater team as we look forward to twenty twenty one. And you see, you know, all these uh, way too early polls that definitely show that they definitely show, uh, you know, for look for all firmly in the top, like I said, rank fourteenth there, and all those five polls. Uh, there, so um, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it all plays out. We'll uh, we all. We got we got we got a lot to preview this offseason, Will. I mean, there's so so much change here that it's, it's going to be fun to preview it all and try and tinker and and, and figure out, uh, you know, how this Gator team will look next year. And never a dull moment, buddy. That's that's right. the uh, it, it's the appropriate uh, tagline for the for your podcast for the program. And really, that's one of the reasons why it's so much fun, right, is, is all of the different machinations that go into understanding why the team performed like it did and, and how it can perform better. So, um, you know, I look at it and say 2020 wasn't didn't end up the way we wanted it to end up, but it was an awful lot of fun getting there okay. and hope and next year won't be as much fun. If it's eight and if it's eight and four, or not what nine and four at the end of the year, um, you know, next year is going to be one of those where the demands, especially with coronavirus gone, a full off season, um, Mullins handpicked quarterback, all those sorts of things are going to ramp things up, and you know, we'll see. I, I, I'm 
15th will be a disappointment for me, to be honest. And I, I understand yeah. why people have them there. But, uh, you know, like I said, it's Mullen's handpicked quarterback and it's uh, his guys. And he decided to keep his defensive coordinator because he believes in him. So uh, 2021 going to be an interesting year. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think you know, Will and I will we'll, we'll preview the 2021 offense next week. We'll preview the 2021 defense. Uh, kind of just how we see it uh, as we are in January still. <laughs> and, and how kind of just a preview of what we expect to see. Or I mean, more more so who we expect to see. Now, maybe not what we expect to see, but who we expect to see uh, taking these reins uh, for these 2021 Gators. So uh, what you got coming up this week? Yeah, I'm going to be looking at the question everybody's been asking, which is sort of the playoff, um, you know, the the repeats of the people in the playoffs, and and is there a way to maintain the playoff at four and get a little bit more diversity within the uh, within the system? So that's one of the things I'm hopefully going to be looking at, and then uh, and then recruiting. Right, it's, it's recruiting season. Where I know early signing day sort of. Uh, puts a lull on the national signing day type of thing. But in February, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have full signing classes and we're going to be able to look back and say, what does this really mean? And there are a lot of guys in the transfer portal oh, this yeah. year. And so I do think that things are going to be, you know, two years ago, I would have said you can't, it's really difficult to count the transfers when it comes to recruiting and their sort of spot, fills you know you're bringing in a guy to, to as a band-aid on a bullet hole you're just trying to paper over a spot where you didn't recruit well enough to high school level but certainly dan mullen over the last three years and uh and you know guys like gilbert coming on the market guys like shorter coming on the market guys like bowman coming on the market can make a real impact on your program and not just for a year you know the guys like uh, uh john grenard come in for a year play really well and then leave um but to Marcus Bowman, we got four years of him if he if if he decides to stay for the full four years, and that's a different animal than uh, than the traditional grad transfers. So I'm gonna be taking a look at that too. Yeah, all right, all right. As Will Miles, you can find him at a site readingreaction.com and on Twitter at Will Miles S E C. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at Gator Dave underscore S E C. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.